Yeah, five, four, three, two, one. So, good evening and welcome to this uh, one person, one talk series. And for further proceedings, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Shiv Shankar, uh, the IO president. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Ashok. Friends, today in the second season of One Person, One Talk series, the fourth talk will be given by none other than Dr. Harish Bende from Mumbai. Friends, we all know that joint replacement has changed the crippled patient to have a healthy life. And probably we all still feel that John Charles should have been given the Nobel Prize for doing such a wonderful work in the joint replacement field. And we have such a great improvement in the quality of life following this wonderful surgery. Dr. Harish Pende will be talking about more in detail in his talk, which is named Giving a New Lease of Life with Hip Arthroplasty. We have panelists, Dr. Satish Muta from Mumbai, Dr. Srinivas Yamul from Sholapur, and Smarjit Patnaik from Bhubaneswar. To introduce today's speaker, Dr. Harish Bende, he has done DORTH, MSORTH, DNBORTH, and MCHORTH. He finished his MBBS, DORTH, and MSORTH from Mumbai. Then he went to Switzerland and Germany and did his AO Fellowship in Trauma. Then he went to England and did his MCH or Liverpool in 1996. Subsequently, he worked with world-renowned Dr. Chitranjan Ranawath at the Lenox Hill Hospital for joint replacement as fellow for an year in 97 and 98 to come back to India and start work as a joint replacement specialist. These are some of his uh, professional experience after his MS and DNB. He went to Switzerland and Hanover in Germany and did the AO clinical fellowship in trauma. Then he went to UK and worked as senior house officer as well as registrar at Morrison General Hospital, West West General Hospital, Morrison General Hospital in Swansea, then Omskirk General Hospital at Omskirk. Uh, then he appeared for the MCH auth examination and passed. Then subsequently he worked in UK for some more time as a staff surgeon at Bangor Hospital. And then he went to USA for clinical fellowship in adult joint and reconstruction surgery under Dr. Ranavat at Lenox Hill Hospital. He has been the president of Indian Arthroplasty Association, vice president of Bombay Orthopedic Society, Founder member, he is one of the founder member of Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons, that is Iksh. He is also life member of Indian Orthopedic Association, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Bombay Orthopedic Society, etc. He is working at Center for Joint Replacement Surgery, Lord Clinic in Dadar, Mumbai. He also works at Shushrusha Citizens Cooperative Hospital in Dadar, Breach Candy Hospital. Hinduja Healthcare Surgical Hospital at CAR, SR Meta Cardiac Surgery Center at Sayan. Dr. Harish Bende has numerous publications to his name, including the one with Dr. Sanjati on Indus Knee. He has written six chapters regarding arthroplasty in various books. He has worked as faculty at many national and international uh, arthroplasty meet and he has done numerous live demonstration surgeries of hip arthroplasty also. Welcome Dr. Harish Bende. We have panelist Dr. Satish Muta, a senior orthopedic surgeon working as consultant at PD Induja Hospital and Fortis Hospital in Mumbai. He also works as an honorary associate assistant professor at KB Baba Municipal Hospital in Mumbai, which is a medical teaching institution. He is an ex-executive committee member of Bombay Orthopedic Society, 
Recently in March, he was the organizing secretary for Vairag 2020 Unlocked organized uh, after the first lockdown was over. He, he is the organizing secretary of operating nailing course. We had done four operative nailing course in Mumbai uh, in the year 2016 to 2019. Welcome Dr. Satish Muta. We have another young orthopedic surgeon from Sholapur, Dr. Srinivas Yamul. Uh, he has done his MBBS from Dr. VM Medical College, Sholapur, and Diartho again from Dr. VM Medical College, Sholapur. Subsequently, he went to Miraj and did his MS Ortho from Postgraduate Institute of Swasti of Pratishtan. Then he has done fellowship in joint replacement surgery under Dr. Harish Bende at Lord Clinic in Mumbai in 2007. He is working at present as consultant orthopedic surgeon and joint replacement specialist at Yashodhara Multi Speciality Hospital in Sholapur, Ashwini Rural Medical College at Sholapur, as well as Yamun Orthopedic Center at Sholapur. Recently, he has celebrated doing the sixth second joint in Sholapur. Congratulations, Yamul, and welcome as panelists for today's meeting. Yes, thank you, sir. The Third person we have as panelist is uh, Dr. Smarjit Patnaik from Bhubaneswar. He has done his MBBS and DNBR and fellowship in knee surgeries. He graduated from SCB Medical College, one of the oldest medical college in Katak in 1994. Then he did his diploma in National Board and DNB in 2005. He went to South Korea in 2009 and did his fellowship from Inje University in knee surgeries. And in 2010, he came back to India and started the Department of Orthopedics and Joint Replacement at Apollo Hospital in Bhubaneswar, in Bhubaneswar. And he is working since 2010 at Bhubaneswar in Apollo Hospital. He is a member of National Academy of Medical Sciences and is also assessor and examiner of thesis guide and DNB course coordinator for National Board of Examination, New Delhi. AO Asia Pacific is a uh, faculty for the AO basic course continuously from 2015 till the lockdown in 2020. AO Trauma India it was the faculty for the National Conference course as faculty in 2019. He is a member on the International Anti-Doping Committee of FIH. He is an international affiliate member of American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons and international affiliate member of European Society of Sports Technology, Traumatology, Knee Surgery and Arthroscopy. Welcome Dr. Smarjit. He's, Dr. Smarjit is also actively in, involved in the IOA activities. He is on the basic research committee of IOA as well as the orthoplasty committee of the IOA. Friends, you, you can uh, see my number flashing. If you have any question during the talk, you can send a WhatsApp message on my mobile number. I also welcome Dr. Ashok Sham and Neeral Bijlani, our own Ortho TV people, orthopedic surgeons, for this wonderful media. Welcome all over to you, Dr. Harish, for your talk on giving a new lease of life with the arthroplasty. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shiva Shankar. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. For yes. giving a very flowering introduction, I didn't know that uh, it could be, it looks so good on paper. Uh, I am actually interested in arthroplasty for a long time. And uh, when I selected this topic, giving a new lease of life, I wanted to see and tell you about the stories behind the surgeries. It is not just Ki there was a difficult problem and we solved it. But every problem has a human face. And when you realize the human face and what problems are there and how we can change those things, uh, then you'll feel that, yes, what your trouble you are taking in doing these difficult cases, these are all worth it because they make a huge difference to somebody's life.
So what made me interested in arthroplasty? Actually, I was trained in uh, KM Hospital and then I went as a lecturer in Cyan Hospital when I was working with Dr. Lard. And I was there as a lecturer for about five years. And in Cyan Hospital, all we had to do was trauma and then trauma and then more trauma. So we had a lot of trauma patients with various shapes and size of injuries in any part of a body, usually multiple of them. And we had to treat them with a severe limitation. We had to have a lot of uh, restriction about the instrumentation, implant, the space, the time for surgery, all those things, and obviously the cost. But it told us exactly how we can try to salvage these difficult patients and get the patient back on their feet so they can have a, if not say normal, but near normal life. And that training is extremely important. After that training for five years as a lecturer, I went to England uh, on an ODTS scheme. And in England, next four or five years was reasonably uh, easy because we had not a very large amount of trauma. Most of the cases were planned. And uh, there I got introduced to, in real way, uh, hip and knee replacement surgeries because we didn't have much time in Cyan Hospital to do any arthroplasty work. Although Dr. Lard was my boss at that time would be doing uh, occasional knee and hip replacement surgeries. And that time we would get Dr. Ranawath who used to come to India and demonstrate some of the cases. But the real exposure came in UK when I was working in various hospitals in a national health scheme, NHS. And there you realize that exactly what is meant by a arthroplasty surgery. But it is just a simple standard state for arthroplasties. And then I went to USA with Dr. Ranawath for one year. And that's where actually I was introduced to what exactly is meant by arthroplasty because he used to get a lot of difficult cases, referred cases where things are not very well and he will try to get them back to normal and near normal. And the results were so amazing that that's where I really got hooked onto doing arthroplasty as my major practice. So when I came back to India, I had to go to a lot of places. I used to go to various places, including some of the rural medical college. And there I had to do surgeries. Like I had to go to a place called a Pravara Medical College in Loni. And there I used to go as a visiting professor. And uh, the people used to collect the cases and they would keep two, three cases, either a hip operation or a knee operation. And these were not standard arthritic hip or arthritic knee. These will be usually most of them post-traumatic or post-destroyed because of infection, etc., and difficult hips. And I had to take all the equipment instrument from Bombay. And most of those works were done as a uh, sort of a free work. There was no charge involved into that. We used to get some donations from companies, get the implants free. And the medical college people, the department would try to get everything, you know, as a free thing, as a donation from the company. So, there I realized that each patient, which you see as just a next case of knee or a next case of hip, is not just a case of a knee replacement or hip replacement. Behind every hip or a THR which you do, there is a patient. He's a human being. He has a family with dependents. And all of them, when this guy gets ill or injured or fallen down or become sick, all of them are suffering. There is a financial loss, emotional stress. This changes their life dramatically. And I've seen sometimes people from a reasonably well-to-do level can suddenly go back into poverty. So that one problem can push them back into a very severe problems. I remember of a patient in uh, this Pravara Medical College where they had uh, brought a driver and this driver had a bilateral avian and he was bedridden for almost about one year because of severe hip damage. And there was nobody who could do THR in that time. I am talking about 1998-1999. So THR was as such not very common even in Bombay or big cities. And this was a small rural area. So we took the cemented Indian hips. We did both side hip replacement surgery. And within a matter of six months, this guy was back to his work. And he was driving the car, driving his vehicle. And his entire family, which otherwise would have been in a severe poverty, came back. He could educate his people. So, in fact, we had, I had one of the students there had taken a thesis where he collected all the patients which were done by us in uh, Pravara Medical College. And there are almost about 20, 25 cases. Most of them were from poor farmers or from the Adivasi uh, people. 
and they he he reviewed all those patients at the end of two two and a half years. He actually went to their homes. I had given him some three four uh, rolls and a camera, and I told him to get photographs of all those patients of what actually they are doing now. So he had some of the amazing photographs of this patient who has undergone THR surgery and what actually work they are able to do today when once upon a time they were completely bedridden and in a lot of pain. And some of those people like one Adivasi lady was able to go down almost about five kilometers from the place she was living with two large vessels of water because every day she has to carry water from that well back to her home. There was a couple of other people like farmers, they could do sowing of you know rice field, work in a paddy field, or they can milk the goat by sitting on a floor. Now, although we say that you are not supposed to sit on the floor, these issues didn't apply to them. If they could do it, they would always do it. So they had amazing way of adjusting to the limitations put by replacement surgery, but basically their life has changed. And many of the families I could saw, which would have gone into penury, in poverty, have come back to normal level. And that's where I realized that behind every hip, every knee which you do, look at the patient behind it. Look at that human being. Look at the family with dependent people. Look at their other issues and stories to listen to. And in this lecture, I want to tell you some of these stories which I found very interesting because these are the people who have suffered a lot. And you, when you try to get them back to normal, you really are behaving like as far as they are concerned a god to them so let's go to these stories story number one now this is a young teacher 35 year old patient and he was living in interior of maharashtra he had an early avian on one side of a hip and he had a hip pain now this was almost about uh, 20 years ago and uh, there was not many 25 years ago maybe there was not too many people doing replacement surgery so he goes to one local doctor, local orthopedic surgeon. This is a picture of his hip, uh, right hip, 35-year-old male patient. And he gets a bipolar surgery because of the pain. And these are cemented bipolar done. You can see the date on that x-ray. It is 5, that is uh, May 95. Now, this is obviously not a good option for a 35-year-old male patient. Uh, he was fine for a few months. And then within six months, he started getting pain. And there was a loss of cartilage and a significant pain and by the time it was December, that is six months down the line, he had already osteolysis. You can see the osteolysis at the neck of the prosthesis and complete protrusion and complete loss of cartilage. So he goes back to the similar same surgeon and the surgeon does a total hip replacement. Now in 96, there were not many people doing total hip replacement and this is one of the interior of the uh, Maharashtra. It's not a big town or a big city. And if you can see the totally replaced pain, this was immediately post-surgery x-ray. And you can see there is already osteolysis radiolucent line around the stem, around the acetabulum. And acetabulum also look a little vertical. So this was in 796, about uh, maybe seven, eight months following the primary surgery. And you can see that this hip started dislocating. No wonder that there probably was orientation issue, acetabular orientation or a femoral orientation. After a couple of dislocation, when it wouldn't get reduced, the surgeon decided to revise it. So you can see the dates 396 and now 896, already a first revision is done. So instead of a normal hip, which was a something like a polished taper stem, the surgeon has used now a chanle type hip. Now this was a copy, not original chanle, because they couldn't afford original chanle at that level. So this was a 22 head instead of 28 head. And another cemented cup, you can see the cup shape and those lines of uh, wires are quite different. So he gets first revision, 896. And then he continues to dislocate in spite of the revision. Eventually, during couple of revision, couple of open reduction, he gets infection. And then surgeon decides to remove the hip. So the hip is removed, leaving behind that acetabulum, which was cemented very well. Obviously, this is not going to work very well. He had to undergo a couple of other surgeries. And ultimately, he ended up like this, 2002, that is November. So we started from 95. The story begins in 95, and we are seven years down the line. This is the condition of a hip. 35-year-old guy has now become 42-year-old. He's still very young, a school teacher, not very rich, but somehow able to manage. And believe me, this guy is so optimistic, the patient. 
that he was still able to go to the school on a on a bicycle because his opposite hip was normal and he said doctor i would keep on doing like that for the next two years but two years down the line this is the condition of the hip on the right side in 95 and this is 2002 two years down the line this hip opposite hip started developing avian and now started becoming very painful you can see that opposite hip also has got avian now the primary hip has already got excision hip with a shortening now he goes back to the same surgeon it is very surprising how our patients you know are very uh, obedient many times they keep on following you in spite of you know having bad experience in the past uh, then the surgeon has done now a non cemented thr for the patient you can see that the cup is not centralized cup is quite lateralized patient after the surgery said doctor i had a lot of pain difficulty and i was not able to walk very well it felt like i had unusual hip my there was stiffness feeling of my hip the newly operated hip out of sync while walking and the right hip continued to give a pain so eventually he tolerated that for the next one and a half year 18 months and eventually he landed up in bombay with us so in these last 10 years he had seven surgeries multiple problem and pain and dis difficulty from the beginning imagine the life of this guy 10 year of suffering this is how he was when he came to us we wanted to tackle this side first we did a non cemented hybrid thr uh, the non cemented cup and a non cemented stem we had to do subtrochanteric osteotomy this was in 2005 imagine his first surgery happened in 95 so this was almost 10 years from the time he had the first operation then he this healed very well one year down the line he was reasonably happy and he was able to go back you can see that the trochanter is lateralized we have got good length we have got good orientation and the thing has healed very well this was about a year down the line and this has healed now he was worried about the opposite hip which was non cemented which was working according to him in a not in a sink while walking so we thought of revising that too and he agreed immediately for that because he was so happy with the right sided thr which was done for his excision because his length was restored back his ability walking ability was restored back to almost normal so during the revision surgery of that opposite side we found that the hip which was done by the surgeon was actually retroverted 20 degree rather than being antiverted 20 degree on the left side you can see how it was and on the right side you can see how it should have been so we changed that with a new orientation then we also had to do a trochanteric osteotomy we have to medialize the cup which was lateralized too much and we adjusted a soft tissue tension by doing the osteotomy so post surgery this is how he was and you can see that you can centralize the acetabulum the offset neck length has been restored back and both the hips have now got an equal limb length so this was in 2006 we had done the surgery now it is almost uh, since then 15 years now this guy is walking with good legs, both sides equal length. He's gone back to his work. In fact, he has now bought even a farm, small farm. So he start working in a farm. In 15 years, he come every year. He comes from the village, brings something to me. He talks up. This is from my farm. This is specifically for you. And he is extremely happy so far. So the patient who was suffering from a simple thing like an avian hip because of absence of proper treatment for 10 years, and then you convert that entire thing back to the normal with hip arthroplasty. For you, you are technically like God to him. So it's very important to realize that when you are doing these surgeries, for or for that matter, any orthopedic surgeries, you are really recreating the lost function of a patient to bring him back to normal and a pain-free life. Story number two, we go to the next patient. This is a 28-year-old male patient. He was a student in a university. Obviously, at that age, you are very happy about going on a bike. And uh, maybe you may have a girlfriend on, the, on your backside. And then you really uh, get all those hormones pumped up. So he had a very bad motorcycle accident. He had a head injury. He was unconscious. And he was unconscious for almost six to seven months. He was on a ventilator for the first three months. There is a large uh, scar on his uh, neck of the the tracheostomy which was done eventually he survived during that period i don't think doctors realized that he will even survive with 
that's that's your head injury so he had a bilateral acetabular fractures which were technically were untreated because they were not sure that he will survive that accident and a head injury but eventually he did and by the time he improved his head injury improved he was able to sit up they realized that both his hips have become completely fused because of fracture and then secondary uh, bone formation the hydrotropic ossification which has formed around him the head injury improved with some amount of hemiparesis left on one side it didn't completely recover but he was otherwise very well conscious very very well oriented and had a problem problem was he was not even able to sit properly he was not able to walk he had to be lifted up by two people to make him stand so this is how he came to us when he came to us he has got both hips which were completely fused you can see that there is a fracture dislocation of both the hips there is a lot of osteocyte uh, extra ossification which is formed the acetabulum is actually not uh, you, you you do not know exactly where is the normal acetabulum and which are the normal orientation and he had gone to few people before coming to us and many of them had advised him that you are so stiff so fused with one side abduction one side adduction you can see on the picture and he was not able to even sit because of the pain that you should do excision hip at least there will be some mobility on both the sides and you will be able to at least sit properly on a chair or maybe on a commode but he didn't want that kind of a thing so he eventually came to us we offered him surgery and it looks very bad but issue at that point was if you don't do a proper hip replacement give him a mobile stable hip this guy who's 28 year old he will not be able to do very well in the long run in his long life so we decided to do the surgery of replacement uh, we had to do ct scan we had to plan the location of a uh, ankylosis mass we had to plan about how to approach the hip we had to plan about where the neurovascular bundle was we had to plan about how much bone is there in the acetabulum and how to orient the components i'll just show you about one side uh, how we did it this was the side which i want to show we had record of both the side but there is no time to do all that so if you see this x ray it looks very bad it you, it's difficult for you to see exactly where is your head where is your acetabulum which are the fragment which is the entry column and because there is a flexion deformity both sides you can see that the pelvis is almost looking like an inlet view so if you see the ct scan this is how the ct scan sections look but if you take a closer closer look at this you can see that this is a extra bone which has formed on the acetabulum but which is at a higher level you are going from higher section or higher cuts lower to lower cuts these are the horizontal cuts if you go at the lower cut you can see that there is a trochanter which is gradually being seen and a back of the trochanter that is where you actually approach the hip in a posterior approach has no bone coverage over there and you can see that in a lower part the head is reasonably intact connected to the neck, connected to the trochanter so that form is intact and not deformed and if you see medially there is adequate bone formation there is a major bone formation in the front that is a major myosinus mass and some bone formation in the superior part so what we thought is we can go from the front we remove that osteophyte remove that bone extra bone and we can go from the back like a posterior approach so we call that as a tent approach this is the approach where you approach the hip from the front and from the back so that you can identify the bony landmark you can remove the extra bone formation and you can actually approach the hip so you get a very good three dimensional orientation of what exactly you are doing and where you are putting your cup so with that idea we try to use a tent approach now this is the approach which is we i learned at dr ranaud's place he is very fond of using this anterior flap to get the anterior exposure in addition to the posterior approach and i call it tent approach basically because it explained the way the mechanism of approach very well so why it is called tent if you look at the hip the hip has got a trochanter in the center which is attached to the head of the femur with the help of a neck that's a trochanter and the head is in the center of the acetabulum like a top of the mountain and this trochanter is kept in position by four groups of muscles the adductors the abductors the anterior rotators and a posterior rotators and these groups of muscles if you keep them intact and balanced the hip remain well if any one of these group get damaged the hip will rotate into opposite direction and then the hip will dislocate similarly if you want to approach the hip you can either go by a posterior approach when you remove the posterior rotators 
look at the neck and remove the head or you can go by the anterior approach where you approach the anterior ridge. So if you see the transfer section, this is how what we do. We go by the posterior approach. We remove the posterior part. That's the posterior flap. And then we remove the head of the femur. And then we can do the surgery by shifting the trochanter in the front. If you want to do anterior approach, you can go from the front. And in this situation, you can, if you go by both approaches, we have trochanter, which is in the center, which looks free here. But actually, this trochanter is attached proximally to the abductors and distally to the vastus laterally. So you can shift it in the front. You can shift it behind and approach the hip, the acetabulum, either from the front or the back, depending on where it is easy. And it is extremely important in these difficult cases to be able to look at the hip from the both side. So these are actual intra pictures. You can see that posterior flap is done. And then we rotate the hip externally. And automatically, we can go in the front, reflect this anterior flap, and look at the hip, the acetabulum, the neck from the anterior part. Now here, the flap can be sutured back when the surgery is done. And while doing it, entire abductor mechanism is intact. So we went like this for acetabulum. Now acetabulum, you can see, is very weird. The base of the acetabulum is good, but anteriorly there is a lot of bone mass. And if you have to cook, keep the cup in this particular position, you can see that that is how your cup has to be there. If you keep the cup in that orientation, you can see that anteriorly the cup will be way inside the bony margin of the anterior acetabulum, while posteriorly there is no support to the cup of the bony margin. So we may have to actually put a bone graft behind, although on the x-ray it looks like there is bone everywhere ar around acetabulum. So this CT scan study tells us that I will probably have to put a graft on the posterior part of column, which is deficient because of fracture. And entry layer to remove a segment of a bone, the myositis mass, so that my hip doesn't impinge in the front. So once with that idea, you ex expose the hip from the front, remove the acetabulum, then it becomes easy. So these myositis, which is superior to the acetabulum, we don't have to worry because it doesn't interfere with our surgery because your approach is much below that. So this is after the surgery. You can see that the screw which is there is a bone graft which is put to augment the posterior wall. We had a non-cemented ceramic on ceramic cup, ceramic on highly cross-linked poly. And this is after both the surgeries were done. And this is the AP picture of both the surgeries. And the patient after the surgery was able to walk within a matter of two months. This was about five years down the line. This guy is able to walk very well. He has slight limb because of the hemiparesis which he had. And that limb, the hemiparesis hasn't improved completely. But he's now he's able to walk very well without discomfort. In fact, he's recovered otherwise quite completely well from his uh, head injury. You can see that he's able to sit very comfortably, lie almost like a normal person. One time when he was brought to us, he had to be lifted by two people to just make him stand from the lying down position. So this guy now, the story ends as 12 years of near normal life. He finished his education. He finished his master's finished his PhD from the same university. And now he's a professor in the same university. And every two years, he come and meet us. And, you know, that's the time you really feel that what your studies which are done, what your education which you have got, and what your experience you have is really worth it. So that's the story of a person behind an injury, the story of a life behind a fracture or a surgery, which actually moves you. We go to story number three. That's a 44-year-old female. Now, she had a fractured acetabulum. She had a fallen down. There was actually injury, road traffic accident. But she had also multiple other injuries because of which this injury was missed. And six months down the line, when other injuries healed, patients started getting a lot of pain in her hip. So she went to a surgeon. That was an x-ray when she went to a surgeon. You can see on the right side, the hip has proximal migration. You can see that the hip is not in a location. You can see the teardrop and the femoral head is almost half the length higher up. So patient had a partial posterior superior dislocation and patient has formed a pseudo acetabulum there. You can see the CT scan and you can see the CT scan close up. You can see a actual true acetabulum here and the patient has formed a pseudo acetabulum on the top of this. And this is how the patient went to the surgeon where 
she was advised that the hip replacement should be done. Obviously, this was the solution for that because you cannot try to salvage this hip because it's already remodeled into new positions. You cannot get it back to normal. We have to revise it. We have to revise it into a replacement surgery. But when the primary surgeon opened the hip with a view of doing THR, he was in a surgery for almost four hours. And after four hours, the operation was abandoned with a note, operation note, which I saw later on, that acetabulum could not be inserted very well. There was no way to put acetabulum. And then surgery was abandoned and she was left as an exogen hip. So this is how she was when she had a first surgery. And since then, for the next two years, she was walking with a significant limb, a lot of pain in the hip, and which has resulted into pain in the back. Now, what must have gone wrong? We analyze this. This patient probably, when the hip replacement was planned and the hip was dislocated and hip was the head was removed, probably the pseudo acetabulum was thought to be the real one, and the rimming was done in a pseudo acetabulum. Obviously, it's a small thin shell of a bone, and you can see that there's a CT scan done after that surgery when he when she came to us, and you can see that the amount of reaming done in a posterior wall just where the pseudo acetabulum, acetabulum was. And you can see the CT scan X-ray. This was a pre-surgery and this is a post-surgery. You can see that there is no posterior wall here. So this is how she was when the head was in position. And you can see on the right side, this is how she was when that pseudo acetabulum was tried to rim. So now there was no posterior wall. There is just a wall medially. There is anterior pillar and a medial thin plate. And this is how she was. So if you see, if you analyze this X-ray and CT scan, we have to make now a new acetabulum and put a cup in a position where you can get a proper posterior side. So we initially thought to put a cup like this. And if you can see that, if you analyze the CT scan and you want to put the cup with normal 15, 20 degree antiversion, you have almost no bone on the back. If there is no bone on the back, you have to put a graft. But unfortunately, there is no head now. So you may have to take a graft either from an allograft or you have to take a graft from acetabulum. So we plan to have both the things. We had an allograft from Tata Hospital. We also decided and told the patient we might have to take a graft from the iliac crest of a patient. But usually that may not be very good in female patient because the iliac crest is not very thick and it may not have adequate bone quality. So we didn't know exactly what to do. We had all those options available on table. And when we went inside, we realized that we can do another thing is we can use a smaller cup and maybe medialize the cup. And that's a technique which we normally use in many of these difficult cases. So we can have a smaller cup, which is medialized a little bit. So it gives you some amount of posterior wall support. And if you get 70% of host bone support in this deepened cup, the cup which is centralized more than normal, you may be able to get away with a primary cup without requiring a complex posterior acetabular reconstruction. So on table, we did exactly that. And if you can see the frontal plane X-ray analysis, you can see that this is how the cup would be on a normal side. If you reflect that on the opposite side, the standard cup will be too big for the patient. So we plan to put a smaller cup, a little proximal migration, so we can get a little more bone in a superior portion of acetabulum. So you can get a good primary fit. And that's how we decided the antiviragin was planned based on the transverse section. And you can see that's a normal antiviragin. And that's exactly what we want to do on opposite side. So opposite cup has to be in that version. Again, you can see that if you put a smaller cup, you can get good version. So during the surgery, we had done the tent approach. We have gone from the front. So I can see the entry wall very well, wall of the acetabulum very well. You go by the posterior approach to get a posterior structure uh, exposed very well. So you have got a very good three-dimensional idea about the acetabular cup insertion. So this is how the surgery was done. You can see the post-op x-ray. You can see that the cup is slightly medialized. Uh, it is done deliberately to get a better host bone contact. And we could use actually a primary cup. We didn't have to use a, any significant amount of bone graft. And because it's a primary cup, it was a ceramic on ceramic THR, the stem was cemented because the bone quality was not very good. We initially tried non-cemented, but it was becoming very loose. So we cemented a cup. And now this patient with a smaller cup with deliberate mineralization has a pain-free hip. 
She has got no lurch. It's about 14 years down the line. Now she's able to walk without pain. She's going back to the work. She can also use the public transport in Bombay, like trains and buses. And believe me, if you have been to Bombay and traveled by public transport in office hours, that's a phenomenal feat to achieve after hip replacement surgery. So that's about story number three. Now story number four. This is another interesting story. This is a lady who was 31 year old. And from the childhood, she had a dysplastic hip on one side. She had uh, multiple surgeries done at a very young age. She doesn't remember many details of that, but she said that she would be in plaster for a long time and she would be missing her school and missing her uh, you know, uh, home and she'll be hospitalized. And eventually that side hip was quite short and that side entire leg was shortened and she had a lot of limp and a lurch. And she continued like that. She in fact has educated herself. She was working in a company as an executive and she used to travel, but eventually by the time she was 30, 31, she started getting a lot of back pain because of unequal size and unequal uh, gait on her affected side. So she came to us with a history of pain, shortening, limping, difficulty in walking for almost 20, 25 years, uh, almost since her young childhood days. So this was how she looked. You can see that the left side looks almost normal. But the right side, somebody has done an osteotomy. It's a dysplastic hip. There is a very thin and small uh, femur, which is migrated proximally. And you can see there is a pelvic obliquity, which fortunately was not completely fixed. But because of that shortening and hypertrophy of the, uh, of the right side, she was not able to stand very well. So the, you can see there is a pelvic hypertrophy also. You can see the look at the uh, pubic ramus. And you can look at the ischial tuberosities and look at the pelvis appearance, iliac crest. It's quite dysplastic on the right side. So she has got almost like a hemipelvic hypoplasia. And she had to do, uh, she had to walk like that. And she had a lot of pain. So we decided to give her a hip replacement surgery. And this was a closure, close up of that. You can see that uh, the femur was almost thin, like a pencil. And there was an old ostomy. Uh, plate, which is a standard cross slotted plate, and we had to remove that. So we had to decide about the approach. And as I said, we use the tent approach to get the approach from the front and the back. So you can identify the abductors and actually keep the abductors intact without damaging them. Because in these cases, the most important part, if you want to get a real good uh, abduction uh, function and, and real good hip stability. After the surgery, you have to be very, very careful about abductors. You have to be, they have to be kept sacrosanct without touching them. So we planned for tent approach in this. We planned for removal of implant by using old screws. Uh, we also had a tungsten carbide burr so that we can burr the screw out, screw head out if it doesn't come very easily. We had to decide about a slab or a cup. So we thought about using either a smallest cup or with a cage and a bone graft. And we thought about using a SROM implant because that is the thinnest implant which is available, which can actually fit into that pencil thin uh, femoral cavity. So we did uh, this for the surgery. Now I was very happy. This is done by me. And I was very happy that I got a very nice, good uh, acetabular cup, which was the uh, smallest one, is about 40 size uh, or maybe 38 size cup, and with a poly liner inside. And we had to use the iliac crest graft and push it put it behind. You can see the screw to augment that. And we had used a SROM cup. And I was very happy. And the patient was able to walk uh, after the surgery within a matter of three months with the help of Walker. And I thought, well, I am playing God again here. And I have done very well. And the patient should do well. But again, as I said, we are just human beings. Every time we do something with good intention, it may not work because this particular time, the patient did not have a good, a good function. If you analyze this, the surgical errors were there and one of them was the metaphyseal sleeve should not be, it was very small and the ostromy was done almost at the level of that. The stem was too thin. It was not canal feeling, so it was not holding very well. And eventually what happened is this ostromy, which should have been a little distal to the sleeve was at the level of sleeve because there was no bone below that. 
and eventually that sleeve did not hold very well. The implant started becoming loose and eventually patient after about two years came back to us with this picture. Believe me, she was walking on this. She was very happy because her pain had gone. She had a stability, but she said, doctor, for the last six months, my pain has gone up and I'm finding it difficult to walk. And you can see that there's a huge amount of osteolysis around the trochanter. There is a huge amount of osteolysis around the shaft. And you can see that there is something like a wind viper effect because of which the stem is causing a large ballooning of the cortex of the femoral shaft. Now, this is a very dangerous thing. And I told the patient that you may not have a lot of pain, but you may end up in a fracture. So please let us go ahead and revise this. And she agreed fortunately, and we went for revision. This was within two and a half to three years from my primary surgery. We went for a long stem cemented implant and then everything healed. We did a lot of grafting. At that time, we realized that a primary cup which was used worked very well. It was holding very well and the bone around it had healed very well. So cup, the acetabular part was very well. After that cemented stem, it is now 12 years after the surgery. Now she is for the last 12 years, very comfortable. She's again pain-free. She has unlimited traveling again by public transport. She joins her office. She works actually. And every year she comes and sees me. You can see that this is how she walks. You can see that there is almost equal limb length. If she walks, some lurch is there because the dysplastic hip for so many years cannot be completely become normal. But if you see exactly how she sit up, how she gets up on a bed, you can see that she has got an almost near normal hip function. She can make the hip straight. She can lift the hip. She can have good active SLR on both the sides without any problem. And she is very happy so far. So again, this patient had a troublesome life a very painful life for last almost 25, 30 years, but one good surgery or in here you can say two surgeries gave her a pain-free life, ability to walk and be part of a normal society. So this is very important. And this is what I say that behind every difficult case, there is a human being. There is a life which you are changing, the life which you are making so much material difference that these patients are eternally grateful to you and you are happy that things which you planned have worked out in this patient because this is also very important that many times what you plan may not always work out, but you must be able to salvage that and have a second plan like in this particular patient. So we come to story number five. It's another interesting story. Now this guy had, uh, he was a shopkeeper and his shop had a fire. And then to douse the fire, he had, he attempted and he has a lot of burns. And all around the body, almost at about 30-35% burns. And he was in hospital for a long time for the burns to recover. And by the time the recovery of burn happened, that was about three, five to six months down the line, he realized that he is not able to move his hips. Both his hips has completely fused and there was a lot of myositis ossificans. You can see that around both the hips. Now the problem was this guy was not able to stand, not able to sit very well had to walk with a very limited walking ability and he couldn't climb a stair. When he came to us, you know, he, I, I, we had a lot of, I normally like to talk to them for a long time to know exactly what do they expect from us? What do they want from us? And what do they, you know, eventually are going to get? Because all these patients where there are difficult cases, we may not give them completely normal hip joints, but they have to realize that if they try to compare them with a normal person, they may be, little unhappy. They have to be realized, they have to be made to realize that you have to accept whatever best possible a surgeon can do. And that's very essential that you talk to these people at least for a long time to understand their desires, their wants, their expectation of you and make them realize to moderate their expectation. Now, one of the questions this patient asked is, it is not the question of walking, stair climbing and public transport. He said, doctor, can I have a sex? Now, I know this is something which you do not talk in open, but for a young person with two hips in a straight position, he is unable to even move them an inch apart. It's very difficult for him to go through his young life and behave like this. So his one of the questions was, can I have sex once you are done the surgeries? I told him that we do hip replacement, we can do that and probably you will get a reasonably good function in both the sides. So I told him, yes, probably that is that will happen and you can have that part of a life also 
probably normalized. We went ahead with the surgery. We had to do bilateral ceramic on ceramic. We did a non cemented cases. And again, uh, the tent approach you have mentioned was used. We remove all the uh, myositis mass around it. That's after the first stage. This is after the second stage. This was in 2002. You can see the X-ray small uh, date on that. The, he came to us in around 2000. That was just the time when I come, came back from uh, fellowship. Uh, that was in 98. And I was starting my practice. So this was 2002 when I had done both the surgeries. It is now almost 19, 20 years. He is able to walk very well. You can see that if you see him, he is able to walk almost like a normal person. You will not recognize that he was not able to even get out of the bed at one point of a time. He can sit easily. Sitting itself is a big pleasure for them because they can sit in a chair. They can get up and, and you can see that on his hands, the hand still has these burn marks and a little bit of a contracture. Although with the physiotherapy, his hand function has improved, though cosmetically he has not improved much. But basically he is mobile. In fact, this guy eventually got married after about five years of this operation. And uh, he lives in Pune today. He has a shop of his own and he is reasonably happy. So this is a person where thing was very nice. You can see the way he climbs stairs. He's climbing almost like a normal person without using even a, you know, a side support or any kind of a support. And this is the amount of hip flexion they get. You can see that amount of flexion they get. And usually we worry about dislocation in the people, but these people who are fused either by primary fusion like ankylosing spondylitis or people who have got myositis, if your orientation of acetabulum and orientation of femoral cup your offset and neck length ratios are quite right, then these people very rarely dislocate. In fact, because of the reformation of some amount of myositis or a fibrous tissue, they are very, very stable people. So dislocation is not an issue with these people. And these people, if you do a good job, they are eternally happy. He is also another patient. Every couple of years, he come and see me. And then we have a chat of about half an hour. But... Uh, then it makes you feel good that you are doing something nice for the patient and a society. Then we come to the last uh, of the story. We are nearing the one hour time. And this is very uh, emotional story. You know, this patient, this was a 45 year old lady. He had a rickshaw accident. She was going somewhere along with her husband, two daughters. The daughters were eight and 12 year old and uh, one grand, uh, one uh, mother-in-law. Now, the family, when the rickshaw toppled because of some accident on a road, the others in the family didn't have much problem. But this lady herself had a bilateral lower end radius fracture. She has got a bicolumnar fracture of acetabulum and she had a commutated elbow fracture on right side. Now, these are multiple injuries. She obviously was taken to some hospital, in nearby hospital, and they referred her to some other hospital where they approached, uh, they went under some orthopedic surgeon. Now, she had some treatment for lower end radius, some treatment for elbow. They had done some fixation, which wasn't a very ideal one. And for maltreated, for the acetabular fracture, this was a bicolumnar fracture. What the surgeon did was, the first thing he did was, he did an entry repair and uh, entry column and then a posterior column. And then, he fixed both the column in two different surgeries without realizing that the head is also not good. It has collapsed. This lady was kept in bed for almost about four months for so-called fracture healing purpose. And till that time, she had a severe pain, difficulty in walking, and she was bedridden up to five months. So in hospital for five months, then she was told, okay, you can go home now and take further rest at home and start physiotherapy. But imagine this lady five sequential surgeries, five months in a hospital, still unable to stand and do any personal work because both the wrists were malunited. They were completely fused in a flexion deformities. The right elbow, which was fixed, was fixed not in a very ideal way. So it had become completely stiff in about 70 degree flexion, had hardly any rotation. And hip was very painful because the femoral head was collapsed and dislocated medially. So this lady could not just get out of the bed. She required constant nursing because she had to be fed. She had to be cleaned up. So her elder daughter, who was in 10th standard, uh, she was the only person. The husband has to go back to the work. There was no people in the house to look after her except for that very old 
mother-in-law, she was too old to do anything. So the elder daughter stayed at home instead of going to, uh, to the uh, school. And uh, she would look after all these things. She would do all household work. And the younger daughter would go to the school. So it continued for next almost uh, eight to 10 months. And somehow they landed with us. Now, this lady was in a lot of pain and discomfort and disability. We had uh, their social issues because the family, the children couldn't go to the school because of the difficulty in financial thing. They wasted maybe about seven to eight lakh rupees on her treatment. And end of the treatment, again, she was bedridden and she couldn't be any use to the household because she could not even get out of the bed on her own unless somebody was there to help her out. So we had to do both side wrist osteotomies, refix the wrist. We had to do elbow arthritis, get her some mobility in the right elbow. And then we eventually do a THR for the hip joint. And when the THR is done, she was quite pain-free. The hip pain disappeared. She was able to stand. We could make her stand with the help of platform walker because she couldn't hold the regular walker very well because of the recently done wrist surgeries. And then she was mobilized. Then she was told to exercise at home. And this is how she was at the end of uh, surgery. And then she went home. Then I didn't get any call from her for the next almost about four to five months. And suddenly one day I got a call. I was in my clinic about 6 o'clock in the 5.30 in the evening. And this lady calls me and I was worried that has she got dislocation or something. Then she just asked me, doctor, do you know what I'm doing now? Now I said, what, what's the matter? What happened? He said, doctor, I am now in a movie hall and I am with my husband. And in the last two and a half years, for the first time, I have walked out of my house and now I am enjoying a movie with my husband. Now imagine the amount of happiness which this patient had just with a small act, which you just take it for granted that she had gone out to a movie hall, sitting with the husband and watching a movie. She once must have thought that the, everything is gone. She's unable to move her wrist, unable to move her elbow, unable to get out of the bed. So that's the end of her life. And that patient now is almost about 18 years. She again is one of my very faithful regular followers. She comes once every two years. Then we meet again, chat. But as I said, when we talk about these patients, these are not just another hip or another knee which you are done. It's not just another difficult problem which you are solved, but there is a human being behind it. And this human being has emotions. They have got families, they have got problems. And when you look at them and you get and, and look at the problem which is solved and a life which is given back to them, then you feel that, yes, all the troubles which we take as an orthopedic surgeon, all the trouble which you take to get them back mechanically right and on their feet is always worth it. So that's the reason I said it is not just a hip replacement. It is giving them their life back. So and I think if you look at it in this way, you will realize that it's very important to plan the surgery well. Make sure you don't make any things for granted. Make sure you have everything options available. And if you feel that you are not comfortable doing a surgery because you do not have adequate experience, there is no harm in taking help of somebody else. And I always tell my fellows that when you go in your practice, go in a group, make a group of two or three people, either of your age or somebody senior to you. And if you have a problem, there is no harm. There is no, uh, you know, to worry about calling somebody else to help so that you do the surgery in the best possible way, because usually Orthopedic surgeries, once they are done, if they are not done well, they create a huge problem for the patient. It's much more difficult to salvage them back. So you must be careful about what we do. You must plan them very well. Then all the trouble which you are taken is always worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Harish. That was a wonderful uh, talk you gave and uh, really nice stories we could uh, hear from you and excellent uh, cases and uh, they all will be blessing you for the wonderful job you have done and your nicely shown cases that uh, a stitch in time saves nine means uh, a properly treating the case is also very very important don't take anything lightly that's very very important so you have to plan well execute it well and take the help if you are uh, in a problem all the points you have made it uh, very clear uh, 
yes we do get such patients one of the reason is uh, we don't have a national health uh, system which take that you can stop sharing the pain which takes care of the patients problems so they have to sell out for treatment from their own pocket because they are they don't want to go to the government set up for the treatment and they don't have money to because this is these are something which comes as an unplanned uh, accidents to them so that is one another reason this is something which is unique to this part of the world which our western colleagues in europe and america will not understand and will not have the expertise to solve such uh, complicated cases and uh, really wonderful cases and uh, now the your talk can is I, open for discussion can i make one comment yes dr shiv shankar yeah uh, in mumbai many times when i get a patient which is very complex like which we cannot handle in the clinic level and if they are not willing to go for a bigger hospital where i go like say bridge candy or hinduja because they are expensive one then i normally tell them that it is much more easier and worthwhile going to a medical college and get a treatment there because you do have a lot of good surgeons in medical college like km sayan and nair yeah. and they will do a much better job than trying to go to a smaller place a smaller nursing home with inadequate facilities just because the cost is not you know uh, cost is low so if yeah. you can't afford a big hospital maybe medical college at least in bombay i can assure you that there are enough number of good surgeons who can do a wonderful job they are experienced people and they will get a really good job so they should not be able to you know uh, have any problem going to medical colleges correct yes okay now any questions from other faculty now or any comments yes srinivas yes sir sir relating to your case number 1 it is of uh, almost 25 years back but still in 2021 uh, we get uh, some cases of bipolar done in a stage 2b or stage 3 avian or even in a failed intracapsular fractures so what is your advice for all the surgeon for treating these cases sir Uh, Harish, you are muted. Harish, you are muted. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Yes, sir. Even in two thousand twenty-one, we get uh, some cases of bipolar being done for stage two B or stage three AVN, or in some patients of failed intracapsular fractures in young patients. So, what is your advice for those surgeons for opting for bipolar even in younger patients? uh number 1 it is a misconcept i actually have just recently written a chapter on uh, failure and revision of bipolars in one of the arthroplasty book and they were, i have analyzed lot of cases lot of studies of bipolar done how well they work how long they work what are the failure factors and when they are revised is it a simple changing of acetabular cup retaining the stem and usually when you are trying to change the bipolar to a thr very rarely maybe 10 or 15% cases the stem is retained more often than not the stem has become loose there is osteolysis osteoporosis or you may not get a adequate matching component of a acetabulum which will go on the same stem yes sir so you end up doing a revision surgery so if it is a young patient who is below and young is by that mean at least 65 or up to 65 i call them as young people 65 to maybe 75 they are intermediate above 75 you can call them senior or elderly because then depending on their health they do not have 10 15 years of life so anybody yes, up to 65 if you have got a arthroplasty to be done it should be thr there is no question about it bipolar is a bad option especially in a young and young by that i mean up to 65 year of age yes sir okay anybody yeah Dr. yeah harish can i ask a question <laughs> yeah sure let me first congratulate you beautiful cases and as always it's been a great experience uh i wanted to know what is your take on this 
dual mobility thing now that lot of it is being told to us told to us in two scenarios in a young patient where you are going for a thr does it give much better range of motion and in a elderly where you are planning a bipolar is it a more stable situation i mean should you primarily plan what is your take on that uh let me put my personal opinion now this is not opinion of a from any book or from any other author dual mobility is a compromise of both the things it has got something of both and it has doesn't have something of both so it is a comp double compromise like if you want to have a stability then the largest ball which you can get is a bipolar right because that is the largest you don't have to even put a dual mobility shell behind that number 2 so bipolar would be technically more stable than a dual mobility if you number 1 if you balance the tissues well and if you re suture the capsule back properly many time people when they do bipolar they do it very casual way of doing it you know it's not you don't worry about the posterior flap if you go by posterior approach you don't worry about using the so called run out bony stitch sutures etc suturing the capsule usually the bipolar is done with a many surgeons take a pride oh i do bipolar in 20 minutes now that's not something to be taken to be proud about so if you do bipolar as if you are doing a thr they are very stable and i would say more stable than dual mobility dual mobility you have to rim the acetabulum you are increasing the complexity of a surgery and for elderly person where you worry about dislocation you don't need to increase complexity by reaming the acetabulum putting another component there and in young people the bipolar uh, the thr is a better way because dual mobility has got rubbing of poly on both the side the outer side there is a metal shell inside there is a head of the femur so that poly which is being worn out from two sides will definitely produce more poly wear more osteolysis there is no long term results of dual mobility beyond 15 or 20 years but if you see long term results of non cemented thr or cemented thr in young people there are plenty of the articles where they have shown good result at 20 25 year but there will not be more than maybe one or two articles with more than 15 or 20 year of long term result in younger people so young people doing dual mobility is just telling yourself that i am scared of doing thr for the worry of dislocation so if you are scared of thr getting dislocated you do dual mobility that's my view about it so i have done dual mobility maybe three or four times in my entire practice in the last 20 years so there is no specific indication in your practice for a dual mobility no unless there is maybe a person with a neurological deficit and acetabulum is gone where you can't do bipolar so you have to put something you know like a acetabular cup then you can do dual mobility or very elderly people with say parkinson or other neurological issue uh Yes, sir. Smarinjit, you yes, want sir. to ask something? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I basically, yeah. I, I really appreciate all the cases which you have been discussed and you discussed, sir. And definitely, as you told, we touch lives by doing proper surgery. And totally, replacement has been the most successful uh, orthopedic sur uh, surgery. There is no doubt about it. So we'll come back to the basics because of the purview of this one person, one talk, and uh, being a broader platform of Indian Orthopedic Association. sir how important do you think is a proper cementing technique which is very important because in your first case and uh, case number 4 also uh, we have seen that uh, the uh, doing a proper cementing hip uh, bails out of a lot of situations and doing a improper cementation like in the first case we had to convert it into an uncemented hip so definitely a message probably can come from you or what do you think your thoughts on doing and learning the proper surgical steps of a cemented hip and how important it is and it is as if not a solution uncemented hip total hip replacement is not a solution for it uh, improperly done cemented total hip replacement your take on that sir. yeah smarjit you have raised a very very important point about cementing cemented thr unfortunately cemented thr are less expensive uh, implants than non cemented thr so most of the company will propagate non cemented thr and do workshop on non cemented thr very rarely a workshop from any of this company 
on how to do good cementing because they will have to sell three cemented component or three cemented thr to make money from selling one non cemented thr these are financial things so i haven't seen many time cementing technique workshop conducted by a top of the line companies you know implant companies but they do a lot of workshop for non cemented technique now if you ask me i was lucky to be in england for about 4 to 5 years and one of them one of the year i was in a place where he was a chanley registrar the concern was the one of the first chanley registrar so they would do the thr primary thr do going by trans trochanteric approach a proper classical cementing thing and there i really realized that cementing technique is something which you, you just have to learn it's like having a good handwriting you just have to learn it but once you learn it it becomes a natural habit it and it is probably one of the very easy thing to do if you have a simple instrument you don't need to have very complex fancy instrument and it can bail you out in many situation in fact even in young people if you do a good cemented thr and we have done it because where wherever i used to go in one of those rural medical college where i mentioned these places i didn't have access to non cement thr because they were simply too expensive so good cement thr are seen working for easily 20 years plus because i have my own cases of 20 year plus which have worked very well it is not a cement bone bond which fails the what fails is the osteolysis because of the polywear and cement bone bond will re, will remain very good for a long time in fact in early stage many of the time when we revise the cemented thr the stem i sometimes have retained and this revise the poly cup because the cup has worn out and there may be little osteolysis around the trochanteric area so number one cemented thr is definitely a good option number two it can be done in a young people number three the technique must be learned by the surgeon unfortunately it is much easy to do non cemented you don't have to worry about preparing the canal and curing the canal and packing the canal and drying the canal all those in order you just hammer it in it is stable little varus little valgus in non cemented same doesn't make a difference so technical exactness is required but if you learn that which is not a difficult thing to do and ioa can conduct the workshops where you can teach a young orthopedic surgeon how to do a good cementing it's very simple you, all you need is few cadaveric bones and it can be shown and demonstrated it is not a rocket science and if you do it for all bipolar cases which you all get anyway people are doing it practice on that so you can easily learn it so it can be done in young, young people no problem there if you are short of money what i normally do in this case is i use a ceramic head on a cemented stem and a highly crosslink poly so the poly wear component become very less and a failure is not because of failure of cement bone bond failure it is a polywear related osteolysis very true sir okay sir before anybody asks uh, one more important point which you touched was the yeah. second case where we, we had a bilateral fused tips and nowadays people who have started doing totally replacement and even seniors who are into the business uh, there is lot of talk about the spino pelvic alignment and all that so please give your uh, view on that uh, spino pelvic alignment and especially in cases where we have uh, take downs and uh, difficult problems yeah. two things we have to remember when you have fused hip the hip fusion could be because of the ankylosing spondylitis where your spine has ankylosed before the hip and the hip has ankylosed later and during that period the spine pelvis has become a fixed single mass and then hip joins to that and you are just changing the hip and then it is important to know that how is your pelvis going to be if the pelvis already oblique tilted one way or antiverted or post retroverted then you, when the patient stand the acetabulum will, will be in a particular position so to put the acetabulum you must be able to assess how will be the position of pelvis when the patient is going to stand after the hip replacement is done and if the spine is fused like in ankylosing cases then you have to analyze whether the spine is fused with excessive lordosis or flat back or whether the spine is fused with scoliotic tilt and then which side is up which side is down now this is one part part 2 is if the hip is fused because of the hip pathology like a, like a myositis which i shown you or like a post traumatic uh, bone formation both these cases are of that type in which case your spine is normal 
the patient has a normal mobile spine and unless the patient is having that fused problem for a very long time and develop a secondary scoliosis which has become fixed usually when the hip replacement is done your pelvis will automatically get back to the normal orientation because the spine and pelvis is mobile so this spino pelvic issue is required to be addressed more often when the patient has got a fusion of a spine to the pelvis so that you have got a fixed pelvic obliquity and that can be assessed by taking a pre op x rays of a spine you can take a standing x ray ap x ray lateral x ray and a forward backward bending x ray if there is a fixed obliquity and you have to address that by positioning your acetabulum so there are angles at which you have to check how much angle you have to adjust for pelvic obliquity etc etc that's a complex topic you know it's difficult to explain but your point is very valid in a fused hip you need to address that if the spine and a pelvis are fused to each other with a fixed obliquity there sir in the in the case number 3 which we saw that we missed that uh, fracture dislocation so your uh, your take on uh, what is the importance of uh, trauma series x rays in a primary polytrauma settings sorry primary polytrauma patient when we are handling in the yeah. emergency The yeah, trauma yeah. series X-rays which we take so that we don't miss yeah. these injuries and uh, it is, they become it, a yeah. problem. It is very important to have a protocol when you see a multiply injured patient when you have got a more than one skeletal injury and one of the central system injury like an abdominal injury or a chest injury or a head injury. So these are called poly trauma patients where you have got a one major system and two major bones which are affected. and these ideally should not be treated in a small nursing home they should go to a hospital which has got a good icu backup you may require even a general surgeon or you may require a neurosurgeon so it is a team approach and there you must have a protocol of taking certain number of x rays like spine x ray cervical spine x ray pelvic x ray and all those things so you do not miss anything usually we are attracted or the attention is attract get get attracted to the major injuries like head injuries or open bone injuries or open fracture injuries and the deeper internal injuries are sometimes missed like the spinal injuries or like you know the pelvic injuries or acetabular subluxation and then in the long run if you miss them then the patient ends up into a big problem so it's very important in these patients when you expect a high velocity injury high trauma injury and we used to see that a lot in sian hospital i was a lecturer there and associate professor for 5 years we used to get almost every emergency at least couple of these high velocity injuries when fallen from the you know railways or fallen from the motor vehicle on a highways because that was the main entry to the bombay sian hospital so you need to have proper protocol in these cases to see exactly what things are there we had made a protocol we had made a uh, emergency ward and multicolor thing like there are different color for a chest injury the abdominal injury and each injury how to assess was a form made and each form was colored with different thing so when a patient you open a folder of a color and you know that there are three colors are there means he has got a neurological injury abdominal injury and orthopedic injury so that way you can do a protocol and most of the trauma centers should have that yes sir uh one question harish it would be a uh, big help for beginners when you are doing a thr for a avian or something in a young adult one of the biggest worries that we have is creating a limb length discrepancy so what are the steps you take pre operatively and intra operatively to ensure that you get the correct length number one in pre op you must make sure that you have to assess the offset of that patient each patient may not have the same offset some of them have a have got a little varus shape with a big offset some of them may have got a little valgus hip with short offset and you must try to plan your implant accordingly like if a patient has got a long offset little varus hip and you miss it so on table when you try to cut and use a normal 135 degree offset for a 135 degree angle hip implant then your implant will be vertical and that laxity is taken care of by instead of having a horizontal laxity it will be vertical laxity so automatically this if you elongate so number one is pre op you must assess the offset of a patient 
for that you must have a standardized x ray where you can get a standard we we get a measuring tape what what we have done simply is you take a plastic tape and at each centimeter we put a small a uh, paper clip and so there are some 10 clips or 10 pins on one 10 centimeter plate we stick it at the level of trochanter and take an x ray on a larger film so you know exactly what is the magnification factor x ray is done with the ap with 10 degree interrotation you know actual offset of a patient and if you feel that offset is more because you can get a template and do the templating then you have to plan the hip you cannot just always say i always use say for example corel and for all my hips it doesn't happen sometimes you may have to do with a different implant so you must check the offset before and then you must check the implant is suitable for that and number 3 what you cannot check in this pre op planning and templating is number 1 is the tissue laxity and that is the biggest problem because a young female with a mobile bone and an elderly patient with a arthritic hip with a stiff hip are two different ball games a young female with a mobile bone with a avian very likely because tissues are loose you may elongate and you may get a longer length so you may have to in that elong deliberately use a little bigger offset so as to take the tissue laxity but not elongate the length and again this can be done only up to a limit because if you elongate offset too much they get a widening of the hip you know they can notice that doctor my operated hip look too out fortunately in india all most of the patient wear sarees so then you don't see the where the hip is but if you get a patient who is uh, wearing say tights or a jeans and they can easily make out when in england or in us people would come and tell us ki doctor my hip looks little bigger than the other one because if you use a bigger offset then we have to tell them beforehand ki okay we have using higher offset to take care of your laxity so that you don't get the longer length so this kind of a planning must be done before you are doing a planned hip for a cold anything case like avian anything intra probably we use a measurement we, we have those measurement where you use a vertical stimen pin the paper published i am one of the author in the paper in 9 in 2000 i think in joa where you use a pin which is put just a near the tal transacerebral ligament kept vertically before you dislocate the hip and make a mark on the trochanter and then once you are dislocated the hip done your hip replacement trials reduce the hip again you put the same pin and see where the mark has gone and that mark if it remains at the point where your pin is that means you have not elongated if the mark has gone distally that means your leg is elongated so then you have to do some jugglery of you know trying to reduce that length so that recording during surgery is extremely important shrinivas smarjit any more yeah. questions uh, yeah. like uh, ct scan in your case it made a lot of difference in the pre operative planning Uh, in the case yes. of heterotopic ossification so how frequently would you advise a ct scan of the hips done and obviously like in post traumatic hips and uh, fused hips they are definitely very important for to be done and uh, what's the protocol uh, in such cases sir two conditions number one if any time if the acetabulum if i feel is not going to be normal now these are the cases where you have got a dysplastic hip or there are cases where you have got acetabular fracture or acetabular subluxation or a pelvic fracture these are the cases where or significant protrusion definitely in a case of revisions where the acetabulum orientation is not going to be normal so you need to know exactly what is the orientation with respect to the formal coronal plane and that you can know only if you have got a transverse acetabular sections on a ct scan where what is important is to have both the side hip i have seen some of the x ray uh, you know uh, centers they give you ct scan only of one sided hip the opposite hip is not included for some reason so i specifically tell them when you send a ct scan to me i need transverse section which involve or coronal section which involve both the hips along with pelvis don't make a half they have a data of both but sometime for some reason they give only one sided hip and then you are completely at loss to know exactly what is the normal orientation of the opposite normal hip because that is extremely important for you to judge 
it tells you where the coronal plane is it tells you where is your normal hip is it normally antiverted more or less antiverted then opposite side you can accordingly dial either more or less so it's very important to get these whenever you feel that patient has got a hip which is not normal but a cases like avian cases like primary oa hip cases like a trauma on the femoral side acetabulum is good femoral trauma these are the cases where i know the acetabulum is going to be normal then i don't need to do a ct scan of acetabulum it is required more for acetabular side than for the simple aspect so if i got any femoral distortions usually i may not need a ct scan a good quality x ray will tell me exactly whether the femur is good do i need to do something else do i need a osteotomy done do i need to you know use the segmental osteotomy or single osteotomy do i need a curved stem do i need a straight stem all those things can be done on plain x ray but acetabular side you need a ct scan if you feel that acetabulum alignment or orientation or bone stock is not going to be adequate I mean, sir, what is this tent approach? Tent is it an acronym or uh, tent is not an acronym? Tent is like you are looking at the hip as a tent with a central pole to which you have to go, and you have got one door to come from the back, one door to come from the front, and the side doors are closed because these are the abductors and adductors. So you can go from the front and dislocate the hip other way, or you can go from the back and dislocate the hip in a different way. so technically you are opening two windows to go into the tent and work in the tent that is the acetabulum so technically it allows you to balance because then you can look at the hip as a four quadrants of soft tissue anchors and these four quadrants are normally one of them is opened up to enter either from the back or from the front and just imagine a tent with a central tent pole with four rods connected to them you just cut one rod even the other three are very good the tent will fall on the opposite side and that explain you if you have got a posterior approach and if you don't repair that very well or in a posterior approach if your anterior structures are very tight then that tent will dislocate on the tight side and the ball will come out i'll give an example and it is very common you have a case of tc fracture neck femur and somebody has done a, a open reduction and fixation with a two pins usually we do open reduction from the anterior part and you reflect the portion of your anterior capsule look at your reduction put your two or three screws according to your logic fix it very well it may heal it may not heal suppose if it doesn't heal develops a avian you want to do thr now it's about 6 8 months one year down the line the head has collapsed now surgeon has taken a lateral incision gone in front of the hip reflected the anterior capsule to some extent to expose that fracture area and sutured it back so there is a lot of fibrosis there these hips when you want to go do thr cannot rotate externally if you see the hip before surgery they don't rotate externally because there is a lot of anterior tightness and you are the posterior surgeon you are going by posterior approach you do posterior approach you develop a flap you fix it back with the anchors to the back of the femur using a proper run out technique through bone holes etc but if the anterior structures which are tight are not reduced are not opened up by your by taking extra anterior flap the hip will always remain slightly interlocated because of the anterior tightness and how do you know that end of the surgery if you keep the patient in a supine position the two legs of the patient should be parallel like this if the operated leg is vertical and other is fallen 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 out that means your operated leg has medial tightness anterior tightness that means when the patient flex the hip because the anterior capsular tightness it will not just flex but also adduct to some extent and this hip will be at a higher risk of dislocation and you will blame that dislocation on a posterior approach but if you know this concept of tent approach that okay the anterior part is too tight so then after doing posterior approach putting the trial component what we normally do is we rotate the hip to see that the trochanter is rotated completely to get 40 degree external rotation if it is not happening then you go by the front develop the anterior flap of the tent approach open that anterior flap till you can get complete rotation and that means you are balancing the hip joint so the concept of hip is a three dimensional concept of hip which tells you how to balance the hip and how to basically get the hip stable so the risk of dislocation 
is minimized significantly. And believe me, if you look at like that, the dislocation becomes significantly less. Srinivas has worked with us for six months. Ask him how many hip dislocation he has seen in our own patients. You are muted, Srinivas. Srinivas, you are muted. Sorry? No, sir. Yes, I have not seen any patient of dislocation in my uh, fellowship of one year there, sir. I know how meticulous Srinivas is because he works with me, no? So, <laughs> yeah. credit should go to you, Harish. Srinivas was one of our star fellows. We are blessed to get good people from all over India. We had almost about 110 fellows so far in the last 20 years. And he was one of the star ones. We, we always remember that. They have got a nice group of Larkinic fellows and they discuss a lot of difficult cases. And sometimes I am amazed at the way they, they are doing the cases. You know, The cases which they do, the, the, the class and understanding they have about arthroplasty is simply amazing. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, I must thank Dr. Harish Pinde for that excellent talk and you made it really interesting by telling a story because uh, if it was a lecture, it would have been probably a little boring, especially for a person who doesn't do regularly arthroplasty and depends upon Yamul for his cases, then it would have been a little boring. But you really made the uh, presentation so interesting and you have shown really uh, very bad cases and you have got very good results at the end. What is important is getting the life back on track that you achieved. Congratulations and uh, thank you very much for sparing your time and sharing your knowledge with us. I must thank Dr. Smarjit Potnaik from Bhubaneswar. Dr. Srinivas Yamul from Sholapur and Dr. Satish Muta from Mumbai for being with us all throughout and uh, asking beautiful questions so that uh, large audience who are listening to this and also will be seeing the YouTube videos later on will be benefited. Last but not least, I must thank Dr. Ashok Sham. Uh, I'll call this meeting ended. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.